All right. Am I on? I'm on. I'm, this is great. I like being on. Um, how's it going? I recognize many of you, and none of you are drinking beer, so all of you have been taken down one notch for <laughs> the time being. Um, so you just kind of had a little bit of a hardware overview with, uh, with Matt, and I'll uh, just briefly kind of go over, you know, quickly, uh, uh, what we're doing from the software side, right? People associate us with SDN companies. So the question is, what, we're, what are we doing with software, SDN, Software Defined Networking? Hopefully we're doing something that's kind of cool with software that introduces new models of control and new ways to interact with the network. And we are, we are doing something very cool. And that's my privilege to present to you today what it is we're doing. Um, so I'm gonna actually say some things today that are kind of important, important points of my presentation. And later I'm gonna quiz you on those important points at the end of my presentation. And the first person who answers those quiz questions appropriately will receive a very cool prize. And uh, Tom, has seen these prizes. He's giving the thumbs up. They're very, very cool. And uh, so take notes, pay attention. Pay attention, Brent, pay attention, all right? All right, I have to, so this is the thing. I don't, I'm terrible at PowerPoint, so I'm gonna. That's why we love you. Slideshow. And you're the software guy? <laughs> oh, that's not the right one. Not the marketing guy. <laughs> Everything is fail. He writes software. Yeah, right. And <laughs> yeah. So he can write a better version of PowerPoint, right? Oh, without doubt. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All right, here we go. You. Show. Next. Next. Okay. So, uh, at a very high level, um, I'm going to just in three slides kind of talk about what the Plexi solution is. Uh, not as much detail as, uh, as Matt, but it'll give context for what I'm about to talk about. So we have hardware and we have software, and the thing to remember about the hardware is that the switches kind of self-form into this network with an optical fabric, and the switches act together in unison as if they're one system, and you sort of inter interact with the network as if they're all one system. Think of it in a, in a way as a kind of exploded chassis, right? You wouldn't really manage this network on a node-by-node -node basis. You're managing it through the controller, which represents the entire system uh, in unison, right? That's the point of that slide. Um, the software you interact with, um, it has policy constructs. Like, everyone knows, I think, I hope, everyone knows what a route map is, right? Route map is like a general purpose way of expressing policy in some other vendor's equipment. Precursor to OpenFlow. <laughs> <laughs> oh, sorry. Yeah, it's a precursor to OpenFlow, right? Yeah. Um, and you have, uh, you have the idea of sort of um, endpoint containers or containers um, that identify characteristics of traffic inside the network. In legacy networks, we call these like IP prefix lists or access lists, right? So you have an access list that says permit traffic from this to this on port whatever. Um, you have prefix lists, which are list of subnets um, or list of hosts, right, slash 32s. Um, in a way, those prefix lists are containers, right, or containers of whatever, endpoint information. Well, we have the same thing inside of uh, Plexi. And the endpoint containers, we don't call them prefix lists. We call them affinity groups. And what those containers hold, it's, it's kind of like, uh, it's you know, evolved past prefix list because we're evolved. Um, it's not just prefixes or slash 32s or max, it's actually metadata about endpoints in the network um, that's relevant to our ability to um, implement policies relative to conversations that are happening with those endpoints. So it, that metadata could be any number of things. It could be as simple as a list of MAC addresses, or prefixes, or both, or ports, or you know, whatever it is uh, that needs to go into that container um, to identify the endpoints that are participating in that conversation. Uh, Derek, excuse me, what can you use to identify the endpoints? Because I know that initially it was only the MAC addresses. Yes. So are you beyond that now? Yes. Okay. 
Um, so you'll see, uh, and because I, I didn't prepare for that question, um, I, I can't answer for you, but in the next version, 2.0, we have all the ways to identify, we have all the identifying information you can put into the container. Mm -hmm. Um, not just MAC address. I think IP MAC now. address, VLAN, subnet range. VLAN. Domain-based information. So all this, yeah, VLAN, subnet so, range. Source and destination? Yes. OK. Yes. Nice. Do multicast participation, everything? I mean. So, so we have uh, policies similar to route maps, but we call those policies, for some reason, affinity links, which is kind of confusing. But it's just a policy. That's, it's a policy construct. That's all it is. And what it is, is, is a policy that says communication from one container to another container should be treated in some manner, right? It should be, for instance, isolated, right? If uh, you have storage traffic and it's replicating, you can even have the same container on the uh, source and the destination. You can say, I really want traffic from, you know, to and from the storage container to be isolated, or, or I should say, to take a different path through the network than traffic that isn't storage traffic, right? So that it never interferes with or competes for bandwidth um, or, or any other such thing with stuff that isn't storage. Um, there's other things you can do. Security ACLs, you can do, you can reduce latency. If you want the best possible um, latency characteristics for that conversation, you can also specify that. So there's a number of things, uh, ways to express policy inside, inside the network. We all good? Awesome. Good. Okay. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Steve is totally uh, it was token. set. He heard, he heard the word storage. <laughs> um, so what we actually do is we take <clears throat> the information, we, we pull in the policies, right, into our fitting engine. It's, uh, and that's a fancy way of saying we have some software with some incredibly complicated algorithms. Um, which I can't even begin to explain, so don't ask me. Uh, and we pull in the information ab uh, about the metadata, about the nodes that are in the endpoint containers that are in those policies, and we evaluate the entire set of policies, right, against the known topography of the network. Topography, when I say that, is a, is basically means a capacity map. It's the physical layout of the network and the capacity between the nodes. S and then, Based on those policies, based on the topography, we calculate a series of forwarding topologies, right? Forwarding rules that we're going to push down into the nodes inside the network. And we score those topologies on some scale. And the best uh, scoring topology becomes the active topology. So this is kind of important. Um, in legacy networking, when you know, some new thing comes up, uh, let's say, you know, Thursday rolls around and someone says, oh, by the way, your weekend, bye bye because I need you to go do something in the network. And you're like, Ugh. so you gotta start crafting access lists and prefix lists and route maps or whatever it is you gotta do, uh, you know, some script of changes you're gonna make. And then you go into the network and you make those changes. And hopefully Monday morning the phone doesn't ring because even though you did all those changes and it all works good for the new requirements, you might have stepped on something that previously you had done. And if any of you have managed a large infrastructure over a long period of time, you know that that happens every single Sunday. At least it did for me, right? So what's really cool about this is that if you have 100 policies, on the 101st policy, when you implement that, the controller evaluates all policies at once against the topography of the network so that all policies are met at once. You minimize the possibility that you're going to impact previous policy requirements. Are we good? Oh, there's something else that's kind of cool about this. Um, I had previously put on this slide that in addition to the, like, the best forwarding topology, we also calculate um, a series of alternate topologies in the case of failure. A transceiver fails, a switch fails, right? We have an alternate topology ready to go that we tell the switch about ahead of time so that if the switch detects that failure, it immediately switches to that other topology, right? Fast failover, right? We don't want to wait seconds for it to reconverge. We want sub, well, it's not sub millisecond, but it's single digit millisecond failover uh, to the alternate topology. 
but sorry, this would be fast reroute on a it's, link failure, yes. not on a node it's failure. It's essentially fast reroute, yeah. right? It's called proactive controller design in OpenFlow. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so what's cool about this is uh, I, when I originally wrote that statement, I, I was under the impression it wasn't all possible failures, but it turns out it's all possible failures. We actually calculate for all possible failures, all link failures and all node failures in the network and push every single one of them into the uh, relevant switches. Right? So if a switch fails, a transceiver fails, a link fails, if anything fails, we already have a topology ready to go to compensate for that, that, that will best meet the entire set of requirements in the face of that failure. But it, it is so, different from Quackamo, right? We don't have TCAM rules sitting there. No. Being, uh, this, so this is, just a ma this is just a matrix calculation that you pre-established, pre right? We have basically backup right? topologies that, sit, that the, the code yeah. controller sits on the switch knows about. <laughs> Yeah. And it can either use TCAMs or uh, ASIC um, you know, forwarding entries Push to implement it. those right from the switch. Right. Use the L2 you, forwarding engines, the L3 so forwarding engines. So it's, engine it's reactive, um, yeah. but it's just being done locally. So you've got control, because you, you've got control logic on the switch right. that's saying this link, if this event happens, right. down this, right. pull this flow. Flush the right. TCAMs, exactly. flush, the, flush the chip architecture and load that's this right. alternate table. That's right. And I'm uh, guessing they only care about the failures that they would be, you know, directly connected to. Yes. So yeah. it doesn't push the information for a Direct. switch, you know, far up the chain. But right. you you connect next hop, you, you detect next hop failures, not next next hop failures, right? No. So, so I, I, I could, I could jump here because I'm like, yeah. <laughs> um, we within within a controlled within a single control domain, right, which is typically a ring, mm -hmm. we detect any failure, any fabric site failure. I Those mean, are communicated uh, to all the switches because a topology is not necessarily. This is this is what's different. I'm not just worried about my next hop. Mm -hmm. I may be worried about a switch that's three hops away because he's in the path. Right? I have explicit paths for some of my traffic from me to get there. There may be that third switch that's in the middle of it. If he dies, I need to change my path. But how will you know that he died if the controller is down? Oh, because switch the switches stuff. communicate to get they cooperate together to enforce that set of policies. Okay. Right? And you don't need the controller for that, and that's another important point. If the controller goes away, the switches will do all this by themselves automatically. So you have sort of like link state protocol running between the switches? Yes. Okay. Yes. It's a I'm protocol good. that we call PSCP. I'm good. No, we don't. No, we don't. We don't call it that. It wasn't, I'm sorry. PS, I don't know, whatever. No. Magic. We call it magic. <laughs> um, we don't call it anything. We call it ours. Yeah, ours. <laughs> A new problem. All right, so here's some uh, here's some prize points. All right, pay attention to this. This is where the this is where the awesome part comes in. Um, so that, that we set some context about how we you know we have endpoint containers, we have policies. So the question is a little bit: where do those policies come from? Where do the containers come from? And how do we get endpoints into those containers? Well. You can use our GUI to log in and manually create all those things and manually populate the containers that you can totally do that. That's not really, in my mind, SDN. SDN means we're interacting with the stuff surrounding the network so that we can do things dynamically. And this is, and doing this actually uh, is kind of difficult. It, it's challenging to do. It, there's there are a number of sort of uh, speed bumps and roadblocks and and it's not, uh, it's not just something, you know, we heard yesterday at the SCDC a couple of vendors say, um, oh, well, the orchestration layer, you know, and they kind of talk about it like there's this magical orchestration layer, whatever that may be, right, you, you know. We but we have, have an API. And using the OpenFlow yeah. and our partners in yeah. the ecosystem. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So uh, they say, well, there's some magical other orchestration layer. And it, it's fine. We can hook into that, whatever that is, with our API, right? Someone else out in the universe is going to pull out an integration. Um, <laughs> I, I almost swore, and I'm not supposed to swear. They, they pull an integration out of somewhere. And, uh, <laughs> and, and they magically make this awesome SDN solution uh, work inside your magical orchestration layer. Um, well, this is the thing. We, we feel we have a pretty interesting way of interacting with the network th through the use of affinities. And affinities, um, that's cool, but manually creating them and manually populating, populating the containers with endpoints is kind of like, um, it's a great way to demo something, but it's, it's not really, that doesn't speak automation. 
And we decided that um, it's not enough to say we have an API. We have to do something about that. But some of the challenges you're going to run into, um, well, we'll just say this first. Within the infrastructure, let's say you had OpenStack Chef, you had a Plexi network, and you have an, you have an S-Flow uh, archive, right? Um, all of those things contain interrelated data, right, about some, about elements in your infrastructure. And we'll say Node Web Server 16. Let's say you have some VM somewhere called Node Web Server 16. You wouldn't call it that, but I, I don't care. And it's the red node, right? OpenStack can tell you what compute node that VM is on. It can tell you what virtual network it belongs to. It can tell you the IP address of the node. It has like a whole list of things it can tell you about that node. Chef can tell you other things about that node. What packages are installed? What roles are applied to that node? We'll talk a little bit more about Chef in a second. Uh, when I say packages, I mean things like Apache and MySQL and uh, different bits of like you know Etsy file configurations. Uh, uh, Chef manages all of that on VMs. So it can tell you something about the configuration of that VM, the operating system, all that stuff. Plexi can tell you where that node is in the network, right? I mean, it tells you it's on this ring, on this switch, on this port, on this VLAN. The S-Flow repository can tell you it's talking to these things at, you know, at these different rates, right? So in our example here, it's talking to something at 100 kilobits per second, but then it's talking to something else at 3 gigabits per second. So all of these nodes have this sort of interrelated data, but these nodes represent that data in very different ways. If you talk to the APIs of all these things, some of them are X XML, some of them are JSON, some of them are YAML, ASN.1, SNMP, um, you know, SQL, NoSQL, HTML. I mean, they're returning information to you in all these different sort of formats. They all have different authentication schemes as well. Right? Some use OAuth and tokens, some use username and passwords, some, you know, SN, whatever SNMP is, a big monstrosity of a failure. Uh, SNMP is a failure, right? Correct. Oh, it's sure. a failure is a configuration protocol. Okay. Just but if I yes, talk to the people... Yes, would have been good. If I talk to the people who like BGP, <laughs> it's been a very successful protocol. Okay. Um, and then even if, uh, even if you had everything in XML, right? let's say everything was in XML, um, the field names are different. Like some people, uh, going with the MAC address format uh, example, um, some people say the MAC address, the way they describe that field is MAC address, right? That's awesome. If everyone did that, life would be great. But not everyone does that. Some people say physical address. Some people say link local address, right? That's the field name to describe MAC address. So everyone describes it in a different way. And then the MAC address format. Some people use colons in between every uh, hexadecimal byte. Some people use dashes. Some people use spaces. Some, one vendor has four hexadecimal digits in a period, four hexadecimal digits in a period. Everyone does it differently, uppercase, lowercase. And this makes workflow automation very difficult to do. Actually, the, the hard part isn't thinking about the steps you need to automate something. The hard part is figuring out how to interact with the myriad of systems you need to interact with to get stuff done. So this is an important point to remember. Um, orchestration is a data integration problem. Remember that. It's a data integration problem. And the problem with the data in the surrounding systems is access, its normalization, and its timeliness. Those are the three problems with that data. How do I access that data? How do I get it in a usable format? And how do I know when that data changed? Those are the problems with the data of the surrounding systems attached to the network. That would be prize-winning tips right there. <laughs> if you want to win a prize. Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you. Oh, by the way, there's beer. But somebody stole the church key. That would be you. I'm looking at you. Good job. You're a real <laughs> friend. It was actually me. I stole the key to the church. <laughs> yeah. It's a stone IPA. It's a fantastic IPA. <laughs> so you know. So we have, uh, we have a piece of our architecture that we call the data services engine. 
And it's a real-time data integration harness for infrastructure operations, right? So what does that mean? Well, we'll kind of get into that. We break provisioning and troubleshooting workflows, right? Whether or not you want to provision a VLAN or you want to um, refit the network uh, for you know, traffic engineering purposes because things have moved or elements have been added to your infrastructure, that be provisioning. Or you want to troubleshoot something, um, you have, if we, we can break both of those workflows down into discrete sort of data operations, right? For instance, um, you could create a data service inside this engine which keeps an updated copy of the MAC table inside your network, right? Or the MAC tables inside your network. And that is a very useful data service to have. You could reference that for a number of reasons. Maybe you're interested in knowing whether or not something moved in your network so that you can recalculate the best possible forwarding topology based on the movement of those elements. But you might also want to know about what is inside the MAC table because uh, some of you know the last time I presented, you know, actually presented, I talked about uh, an individual named Ellen who called me on the phone and uh, was completely unhelpful because she doesn't know anything about IT and therefore she didn't even have a job. But she was like, I asked her the IP address for her phone, she's like, mm -hmm, and she hung up. Right? She made that noise. Yeah. <laughs> right? So eventually, I got some piece of data about her phone, like an IP address. That's all I had. It's all I had. And I had to go figure out whatever I had to go figure out. Well, what if you could actually ask the infrastructure, all your infrastructure, right? Chef, uh, your IP PBX, storage system, your network, you could just say, what can you tell me about this IP address? What can you tell me? And then the infrastructure comes back. All these systems are like, hey, we're here to help you. We're going to make this easy. This is what we know about this IP address, right? It's a phone. It's a VM. It's, uh, it's located on this part of the network. It's talking to these things. By the way, it made a phone call earlier and it was dropping packets, right? Wouldn't it be really cool if you could just ask, you know, the matrix, and the matrix came back and said, mm, here you go, this is everything you need to know. That'd be really cool. Well, by breaking down these workflows into these data steps um, inside the data services engine, you actually almost, you kind of create that ability to do that. And we're actually gonna demo this today, where you can actually ask the infrastructure about a piece of datum, and then the infrastructure tells you what it knows. Is it similar in construct to IF map or? He has a demo as well. So. I don't know what that is, so no. Okay. <laughs> I don't know. Um, or, yes. <laughs> or yes. Or yes. Whatever makes you happiest. <laughs> uh, I guess my answer should be beer at that point, right? So yeah. Yeah. Beer. <laughs> beer yeah. So IF map could be one of the channels for the data service engine, okay. either as input or as output. All right. Yeah. Yeah, actually, IFMAP could be easily uh, be a source of data. I know what IFMAP is. I was just trying to be humorous. So, and I was. <laughs> um, oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah. uh, so, <laughs> um, so what really what the data services engine does is it provides a layer of abstraction um, for a workflow developer uh, where it takes care of access and it, it takes care of normalization of the data and of timeliness of the data on behalf of the workflow developer. So if you want to develop a workflow, you don't have to think about whether it's SNMP, whether it's pub sub, whether you got a poll to get new data, you don't got to think about um, you know, the structure of the data when it comes back, you don't have to think about any of that. There's a layer of abstraction that takes care of that for you. It tells you when things change and it normalizes all that data into, into uh, you know, in this case, uh, JSON. We use JSON internal to data services engine. It's also easily extensible, and this is a, kind of a very important point for everyone who's sitting around the table. Real-time data integration engines are not easy to write. If you have 10 different systems that you want to integrate with, and you want to integrate with them in real time, how do you go about doing that? There's no framework for that. There's, it doesn't exist. Well, let me phrase that. It exists now. It's the DSE. And we want it to be easy for someone to write a real-time integration for another system so that you can have many concurrent integrations running at one time. And if changes happen in any of those external systems you're integrating with, 
you're notified about it or some action is taken. Oh, by the way, there's another important point. The way the data center uh, service, uh, the data services engine is uh, architected, users, this guy who's covering his eyes because he's typing commands and hitting enter, <laughs> uh, he's also a source of data. He's just another source of data, right? We don't, we don't treat users any different than, than other data sources. They type stuff in, that's data, right? And we do something with that data. So what communication happens between the controller, I guess, and this DSE? Is the, con the controller extracting data from the DSC to calculate its paths? Is that? Yep, but we're going to get to that. Okay. Do you see Plexi creating a framework for a standard for industry wide, or do you see this and lead, lead the way, or do you see this as something for your platform only? So the data services engine um, stands on its own, Basically. right? You don't actually have to use it at all for networking. Um, <laughs> in fact, um, Simon's going to show you a demo with SolarWinds, and one of the things you could do with this... If we don't run out of time. If we don't run out of time. We've got 30 minutes, so just yeah, keep I'm, going. I'm hurrying. I'm going to go. <laughs> We're not going to run out of time. Um, you don't have to use it just to integrate with that. It stands completely on its own. Cool. If you... Uh, let's say you are deploying things with Chef, and you're applying roles to VMs, and you say this... You know, you have some class of VMs, and they have the web server role applied to them inside of Chef, which means they're going to get some standard configuration applied to them. Um, and you want to specifically create a group in SolarWinds to reflect that set of web servers. You could use a data services engine um, to automatically create groups in SolarWinds based on the application of roles in Chef or the deletion of roles in Chef. It'll remove it. It goes both ways. Cool. Yeah, Very it's cool. omnidirectional. Thank you. Omniscient. <laughs> omnidirectional. Wasn't that a word yesterday we used? Omni something? Yeah. Omniscient. Omniscient. Omnicomplexion. Open flowers. <laughs> yeah. Oh, and it's written in Python because it's easier for people to do things in Python than it is in C or Assembler. It should be in Perl. In general, if anyone has written anything in Perl, you like Perl? Anyone? Python? Anyone pro program Python? Good. <laughs> Python's good. It's better than Perl. No. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So, so moving on. Uh, let's pull. Let's kind of pull all this together. Uh, here we have a we sort of a, a graphical depiction of harvesting data from Chef. The data services engine is actually um, pulling uh, node lists out of Chef based on attributes of those nodes inside of Chef. It could be roles or recipes, or it can be based on operating system of the node that's managed inside of Chef. And it's pulling that information from Chef and it's populating the endpoint containers with that information and it's doing it in a real-time fashion, meaning as you're using Chef to deploy your web tiers or your store tiers or your app tiers, if there are any relevant uh, endpoint containers inside of our controller, the data services engine ensures in near real time that those containers reflect what's happening inside of Chef. <coughs> That's what that basically depicts. We're taking that information, comparing it against topography, and producing new forwarding topologies, and we're doing that you know, as you're deploying you know, nodes in those roles. You like that font, 8-bit font? Yeah. I'm not going to tell you where to get it because you don't already know. <laughs> <laughs> Just type in 8-bit Mac. There's about 20 of them. So. Uh, the effect that this has, and you're going to see this actually, and there's, there's some important implications about, about how this is working. The effect that this has is, imagine if, um, if you were making a prefix list inside of some other vendor's platform, and instead of actually putting prefixes inside that list, you could actually put a chef node query inside that list. Fun. You don't know how many things there are. You don't know where they are. You're just saying, this prefix list, just populate that with you know, the response you get from querying Chef. Oh, that's what I wanted to have for firewalls forever. What's that? That's what I wanted to have for firewalls forever. Yeah. So you can do that. And it's not just the endpoints. The, the containers themselves are dynamic. The policies themselves are dynamic. If you know that some set of nodes between 2 in the morning on Sunday and 3 in the morning on Sunday are doing an rsync job, you can create and delete these policies to accommodate that traffic when it occurs. You don't, it, policies don't have to be permanent. 
So you can dynamically create and eliminate policies, dynamically create and eliminate the groups, and dynamically populate those groups, add and remove elements. Uh, Derek, you're just giving me new ideas. So I could actually use this to generate firewall configurations and deploy them on the fly. Yes, you could. Well, just just an just an analogy. You I'd know like what? I'm going to reserve a prize for uh, Ivan just for saying that. <laughs> or load balancer configs, or whatever configs. Yes. Yeah, because you're working from a known source. Because you can now link the server to the network, mm -hmm. yeah. and you can correlate the data load, the data loads. Yes. That's exactly right, and it's concurrent. Mm -hmm. I'm going to say a bunch of buzzwords, but all these things are true. It's concurrent, and it's distributed. And this is the really cool part. You don't want just one data service engine, right? You might want multiples. Like if some group of people manage something over an area X of your infrastructure, and another group of people manage stuff over an area Y of your infrastructure, they can both have data services engines, and then they can publish services to each other. Hmm. So you don't have to shove everything into the same instance of the data service engine. You can have multiples. So you can make, like on the OpenStack side, you can make a glance repository available to everyone downstream for image release. If you're the OpenStack guy, you can create a set of services for your OpenStack implementation on your own data services engine. You can publish those services outbound. And, uh, and then someone else, a network guy, can make his own set of services and they can share their services with each other. You don't have to put everything into the same instance. That's cool. I know it's cool. Thank you. It is cool. <laughs> it's awesome. This is what I've been whining on about. This, this, this is one of my favorite unicorns, which you've just killed, by the way. <laughs> this is what I've been saying for Greg, I didn't just kill that unicorn, I laid down with it. <laughs> <laughs> so, now, Derek, does this I'm thing sorry. have some we sort did of it. Actually, um, model? actually to, to be honest, um, this was an enormous team effort, right? Um, I was a developer like a long time ago and I kind of and and making this happen meant I needed help and a lot of people, uh, Simon included, Colin um, our developers, a lot of people put a lot of time and effort into making this real. And, uh, and as an organization, we know, as an SDN solution, we need this to, to actually deliver new models of control and interaction with the infrastructure. You're leveraging your core value proposition by saying the, the value of the Plexi engine is the controller and the affinities that you then have. You, had, you have created visibility between every endpoint in the managed service frame, right? Yes. And what you're now saying is, uh, and I'm willing to bet that customers can't envisage the value of that, that functional capacity. And so they can take that functional capacity and you're saying, look, if you took Chef and your application, your OpenStack engine, and you match the data contained in the Plexi Affinity Controller, you've all of a sudden got an end-to-end -end application service infrastructure that you can say, this, this Apache web server that's running Node.js, this app, there's Node.js app, that's talking right the way through to this MongoDB. You're putting together stuff from the Chef configuration file, from the OpenStack, which gives you storage engine, in, and you can bring all the data, and then you're seeing the flow state across the network as well. That's and exactly right. And all that in a single interface. And that's one of my biggest unicorn writing exercises, Slain. That's what I've been saying on the podcast, is that you know SDN is about this controller architecture, exposes all this networking data, which lets you link it up with all the other data sources. And this is probably the first one I've seen that actually does. Now, does it have any outbound like service messaging bus or anything else that it makes use of? Right, see head well, let's do this. Um, <laughs> I, I, we can, um, you, I think. All right, yeah. all right. Yeah. Well, let's, uh, we can go into a little more details of, of how it's built, but we'll, let's do the demos first, okay. um, because uh, you know, we, we want to be respectful of the little bit of time we have. Yes. So you can publish your information to another data service. Yes. Uh, so, that's a good question. Um, right now, so this is new for us, and we're building it piece by piece. And right now, you just kind of point them at each other, and they share services. But um, if you, I mean, you can authentic. I mean, we could easily implement authentication. And there's a number of things that we can do. And could um, you could leverage OpenStack for the identity services to be able to. Oh, that'd be interesting. <laughs> Thank you. I'm going to do that now. So. You are now a member of Team Plexi. <laughs> I'm going to do that. All right, Simon, you ready? Yeah. Just All right. One one quick question is just about scaling this with the physical topologies we were discussing before. I mean, you know, the, with the multi-dimensional toroidal flattened butterfly topologies, you, you know, you guys were talking about thousands of ten gig ports. Can that all be managed centrally with one data services engine instance? 
Yes. You distribute it. Or we might distribute okay. it. Yeah, you might distribute it, but um, you, yeah, that you could easily do that. Yeah, I mean, if you're ingesting. Yeah, this um, package is just, uh, it's just um, a Python application. It can run on you know, any VM with, a, with whatever RAM and CPUs you give it. Just out of curiosity, what are you using as the data, database engine behind it? Also, that's a very good question. Well, um, no. This is, all, this is all real-time state. So <laughs> by default, it archives nothing. There is no database. We don't want to replicate the databases of all the systems and we get in data no from. Sequel, that would be terrible. Leave it at that. What's that? Just say no SQL. Yeah, no SQL. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> no. So it's all in memory. Right now, it's all in memory. Um, however, uh, one of the you know it, what we know that there's a s number of features. We have, we have security features we're gonna have to put into it. Um, archiving and logging will be one of the features that we put into it. Hey Derek, are you guys? Uh, so, I mean, I think that that's like the, the, I mean, the in game is this kind of idea of this. You know, at some point we get to uh, predictive analysis, right? So we start. You start mapping out your topology, and you start mapping out capacity and your your paths and whatever else. Are, have you all tied that back into your northbound on the controller? Um, so I, are you still kind of in the ingestion? So so some kind of event happens on the network. You've caught that in the data. And now you're going to go out and autom Refactor you know, automatically go out and yeah through flip, this flip through these channels. That's exactly what the network. That's right? what you do. Exactly what you do, and that's part of Derek's demo, not quite okay, mine. But cool. Yeah. VM scheduling example. Of that, right? Yeah. Yeah. But it's uh, it's up to when you build the service of whether you're actually going to change the network or not. We don't right. do it automatically without you know. Yeah. You want me to jump in and <laughs> yeah, do so and stuff. Yeah. Why not? So there's some there's some modeling components here. So what? Uh, my name's Simon McCormack. If you haven't met before. I was on the last NFD, and I've been more of a user of the data services engine than a writer, to be honest. So I'm very passionate about it because I started in being involved with integrations, and you can see my screen mostly there. It's a little bit. Let me squeeze it on the edge there so you can see it all. I started writing and getting involved with integrations before we had the data services engine. What that means is, from an integration perspective, um, here's a lot of data that we've... I beg your pardon, let me interrupt. Yep. Can you see the screen back here? We've got it. It's all garbled. Is there a different resolution you can try? Or, uh... Absolutely. Okay. What resolution was everybody else on, or were they on the normal one? I actually went to the resolution it advised me to go to, but I guess it didn't. Sorry, it needs to be 1024. Well, it's 120 hertz is the problem. How many? Same okay. resolution. Perfect. All right. Sorry about that. No, 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 not at all. Actually, I can I can even see it a little bit better, so that's great. So here I'm showing you a, a classic Plexi network view where we've got the Plexi switches, which Plexi controllers automatically determine the location of. But we've also harvested the the devices that are connected to it. In this case, where we got that from was directly from SolarWinds. So I got involved with doing integrations for SolarWinds um, earlier on this year. We had a couple of customers that are, were interested in it. Um, we, Plexi Control itself has a REST interface. We have Python bindings to get into REST. When SolarWinds introduced a REST interface to um, their database API, the way we built integrations previously, that's what I wanted. I didn't want to mix up protocols because I'm writing a one-off script that, that does this kind of integration. So we went down that route um, with SolarWinds. I built my script. It pulls all the information about virtual hosts, physical machines, virtual machines, network topology type information, gets MAC addresses, IP addresses, VLANs, all that kind of stuff. And it even builds affinity groups. So it builds affinity groups from the, from the SolarWinds um, grouping concept that they have. So it really mirrors it um, back and forth. But one challenge you have with something like this is what if, what if stuff changes? I've got a one-off script. It pulls it all back. It's, the script, I like to think of it, it's kind of my dumb script because it's really it's pretty dumb. Spaghetti code integrated. The next integration I've got to write in that model, I'll be doing the same thing again. More spaghetti code integrated together. Really not, not a pleasant experience. Data services engine completely changes that. So what we've done to convert this, because I wrote this before data services engine was out, basically write a little data, serv data services engine channel that pulls all the data from SolarWinds uh, and then monitors it through the, 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 the basically data services engine view. 
And I can show a, I'll show the end point before I show how I got there. And when I show you the how we got there, hopefully it'll, it'll really see the, the, the craziness of the old method. So here you go in SolarWinds UI, got a bunch of groups. You can simply create new groups. And this is live demo, VPN into Nashua to a SolarWinds system that's in Nashua. We'll call it Nashua. So I'll create a Nashua group. So this is a bit where we cross our fingers and I hope I didn't break something along the way to break my connection. So I created a group within SolarWinds. Now in the old dumb model, my dumb script doesn't know that happened, right? It's just, I'd have to run it again. If I run it again, then it's going to recreate everything again because it's really dumb. So I've got to make my, the old script, I've got to make it cleverer. I've got to check everything and validate everything and it becomes spaghetti on spaghetti on spaghetti and just drives you crazy. The new model with the channel, now the channel that we wrote for the data services engine is just talking to SolarWinds saying, give me information. And in fact, in SolarWinds, you'll look, there's a little event system. So they have events. The events tell you, oh, Group Nashua was created. So when Group Nashua was created, actually what we're doing is we're monitoring the event system. So we've got a channel, pulls the event system, checks when there's a new event, it sees a group ad event, the group ad event has a type, so I'm looking for type 57 for group ad. There's metadata in the event that tells you the group it's added. We can then make a custom query back to get the group information and then publish it on the channel. So now we've published, here's a new group. By coincidence, the Plexi channel we wrote is of course listening for that particular published data. When the Plexi channel sees it, it then pushes it into Plexi and creates a new group. There's a few really exciting things in this. One is I've created a generic event system for SolarWinds. You could use that event data for anything. It doesn't have to be perplexy. It's actually completely plexi agnostic in some ways. Also, when I talked to you about that spaghetti on spaghetti, my dumb script that I kept recreating, the plexi part of it now, I now only have to touch once. We created the plexi channel that takes the feed of machines and affinities and all that fancy stuff, and I've written it once, I don't need to write it again. When we do the next integration with the, the next product, I just need a channel to get data from them. Also, as I said, when I first went down SolarWinds, I wanted to do it because they had a REST app interface, and so it's very compatible with what we're doing on Plexi when I've got one script to do it. But actually, with the channel model, it doesn't matter what their API is then, I just need a channel to get data out of, because it's not going to be in the same script just part of the data services engine. Whatever protocol that the next vendor has to get data out of it, we can get the data in the same way. So it's, the whole thing is sort of like a pub-sub structure uh, with absolutely. data normalizer. Yes. Does, it, does it, have things like, <coughs> it have things for more modern publish subscribe messaging bus, like guaranteed delivery or? Say it, say it again? Like guaranteed delivery, anything like that? I mean, because you can obviously, if you're not in state at the time that the message that is published, you don't see it. Right? Yeah, so, so we, there's certain events that you definitely want to make sure that you get back and forth. So Right, so um, right, there is just like, uh, so we use AMQP as the message bus. Okay. So you can have a reliable, you can implement reliable delivery. Okay. We found it incredibly reliable. And I was, earlier on I was playing with the demo when I was in the hotel, and then I shut my laptop, came in here, walked in here, and then opened the laptop, plugged into the VPN again, and the thing continued to run. So. so so if I would want <laughs> to reliable. use this to configure the firewall or, or the load balancer, where actually I can't rely on in-memory state, I would have to create my own little database to store the information I need so that if I disconnect or if the whole thing crashes or something, I still know what the state is. Um, it depends how you write it. Like you don't, um, it, it all depends on how you write it. And afterwards, maybe over, another couple of beers, I'll, uh, I can, we can go over that, but um, you don't have to actually store state into a database. You, it d depends on how you write the integration. Mm -hmm. right? you can, if, if you lose your source of data, you can just continue to operate on the existing data in memory. And um, if, if you bring your data services engine down or bring it back up and, it, and that, other so that source is still gone, then depending on how you write it, it does nothing. It waits until it has ac actionable data to do anything. Yeah, the way I did this one is that when it first starts up, obviously it pulls all the current data, and then it waits for events to update. If you kill it and start it again, it'll suck all the existing information again and wait for events again. So it's, so it's always up to date.
that so when you say the solar it, winds channel. The solar, solar winds winds channel. channel. Yeah. Okay. So whenever you have a channel and well, depending on how you write it. So the solar winds one, when you start it, it does a big, huge dump of data into all other channels. Well, that depends. It depends on how you it write it. It depends from, on how you write it, yeah. right? Yeah. It, it, may, it may not do that. It depends on what you're interested in from that. You write mm -hmm. data services that pull different kinds of data from these channels. And it, it may or may not actually do an, an enormous dump. It depends on the services you've written. Sure. So you can really fine tune it to just groups in this case. I just grabbed all the groups when I came up and then waited to hear group events for whether I was going to update it. Well, I mean, you're, you're the client and all these, so your API is only going to be as good as the rest of their API. I mean, if their API is something that's persistent and it's going to say, you know, here's a diff or whatever, it's going to give you that ability, right? So it's, it's not that it, so is the SolarWinds API, because that's cool to hear they've got that too now. So is that pretty robust or you have to just pull everything? They, they have a REST API. Right. Um, and they, have, they embed SQL queries into the URL for the REST cool. API. So you can get a big and then just do a diff. You, you, with that, you can actually custom select a, a right. field table from the database by creating these custom queries. Cool. Now, I'll, I'll say one more thing about it, and, it, and it's because um, I want to go back to you, right? You want to? Yes. You want to do? I'll say one more thing about that is actually, um, SolarWinds publish a bunch of examples for loads of different black language bindings as well. They didn't have a Python one when I was doing this, so I started creating it manually. I actually figured out a way to auto um, create a library for SolarWinds, and in fact, if I go to this machine, you can see this little, um, sorry, that it's text. This little, if I do a word count on this SolarWinds class library, this is actually a, um, it's a 7,700 word line um, library that's auto-generated out of um, information that SolarWinds provide, generates a Python library that you can basically access mm. um, all of the database tables and fields from SolarWinds using this little library. Um, and we, we basically created that as part of this development for our own use. <coughs> this, uh, the library we're going to put up on the SolarWinds Stack community pretty soon. And um, I'm doing a session with the THWAC community virtual um, conference in October. I'm talking a little bit about this, so you're, you're, the integrations. You're, you're exposing an interface with all those methods pre-built. Where anybody can call. Yeah, and then you call. can just talk Python, so I can do get um, virtual machines, and it will return me all the virtual machine objects, and I say get IP address for the virtual machines, and just write it in Python and, and get it. And I use that class library in the SolarWinds channel, so I don't have to write any, um, I don't have to write any REST calls, I don't have to worry about the SQL type interface. It basically creates custom SQL queries that it embeds into the, um, into the Python library, and the user using it doesn't have to worry about that at all. And you can basically still get any f table and any field from any table by using the library. So, so you do sort of like show tables and show columns on their <coughs> database yeah, structure, I mean, I, I, and then I you create Python code quickly. out of that. If there's any interest, do we want to spend a minute on it, or do we want to skip it? We have, we have hard stop at 3.15, Steve. We have 13 minutes. I've got, I've got 45 yeah, seconds go ahead, of commands do it, do I can it, type. Do it. So I've typed Python. It works on CentOS, Fedora. I've tested it on Mac OS and Windows 2008. Type Python from SW class lib import star. So I've now got a, an object called SolarWinds that I can give it my credentials of my system. I'm going to try not to fat finger it too much. Um, give it the username. So this class that I'll create is basically a placeholder to get the data, but it will manage all the REST query and, the, mm -hmm. uh, and all that other stuff. Admin equals, I don't have a password, whoops, but you know, you'll forgive me for that one. So now I've created object SW. Now SW, I can do SW get, it gives me Orion, that matches tab, tab twice more. And then these are all the database table, um, mm -hmm. yeah, the database tables. So then I can do actually VMs equals get Orion Vim virtual machines. It returns a little bit of debug, just tells me it's alive. I'll turn that off one day. Now VMs, I can do VM1 equals VMs0. Get, a, get the first instance. That's basically the first row of the table. And I can do a get again, get tab. You see these are all the data, so like get name and you get DB2, and then I can do a for VM in VMs, iterate it, and 
vm.get name. And these, these names all match exactly what's in SolarWinds because mm -hmm. I sucked their data out to create it. So there's no typos in there because it was all automatically um, oops, vm.get IP address. And then it goes through my, all my virtual machines and prints the name of the machine and the IP address. A lot of them have no IP address because they're virtual machines that are in the off state. So, mm -hmm. so, and so you can go on, carry on through the library like that. All right. Nice. Ten minutes. That is just That's really cool. This is really cool, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right. So. Uh, what I'm about to show is real-time integration with OpsCode, uh, with OpsCode's product Chef. And uh, this is actually our GUI, uh, Plexi Control. And what this is, is a graphical depiction of a network policy. The orange blobs are the containers I talked about earlier. And these squares are actually nodes that are inside those containers, right? And uh, so DSG Dev and Toad C3, which uh, you may not be able to read, but those these two nodes are inside the Internet Router's container, and Deep601 is inside the Web Server's container. And we're just going to do something very simple uh, for, this, for this demo. We're going to actually go into DSG Dev, and we're going to change its role uh, inside a chef. Is this integration through the DSE, or this is now This direct? integration is through the DSE. Okay. <laughs> so we're going to turn this into a web server. You would not actually use the Chef GUI to do that. <laughs> I would. <laughs> so right now I'm actually, uh, when I wrote this integration, in, uh, the Chef integration in particular, um, Chef did not support event-based reporting, but apparently they do now. So uh, I need to update this. But in about 10 to 15 seconds, you'll see, oh, look, something magical is happening already. If I do a, a refresh of the display, We'll see that DSG Dev is now a web server um, inside of our GUI. So without actually having to change anything in the network, we're just normally using Chef to deploy web servers or app tier servers or whatever. You just go about your normal business with Chef. The network updates itself based on its detection of those changes. So, so you can build this whole flow process for metal as service all the way up. Yes. Yep. And in this case, I just happened to build a policy that said between the web servers and the internet routers, there should be minimal latency. That's what that blue arrow is. That's the, that's the link or the policy that, yep. that those, those endpoint containers Stretch it out are already predefined. Yep. All we're doing is repopulating them. with the, the double arrow in between the containers is the policy, and it says minimal latency between those two groups. Right. So that's your, that's your affinity link. Yes. Right? Okay. Yep. Yeah. Basically a smart folder. So here I have uh, HipChat. It's an XMPB-based uh, tool. And this is actually connected to the data services engine. And because I have a set of data services already built to accomplish some of the workflows that, uh, that you've seen already, um, when you build those workflows, this is the really cool part about the DSC, automatically you're building operational tooling. So you built this workflow that autom automatically um, adds things to groups inside, uh, inside our Plexi control, inside of our containers, and it detects when things have moved around inside the network and refits the network. Um, in order to do that, I had to build a series of data services to make that real. I can now, when I built those things, automatically I built operational tooling. So I can actually issue this command here. Uh, decorate Mac and I provided it a MAC address, and two services responded to this. The MAC table service responded and said, that MAC exists on this ring, on this switch, on this port, in this VLAN. It tells me where the MAC is. The chef service that we built inside uh, the data service engine says, I have a node with that MAC address, and these recipes are applied, and these roles are applied, and here's the IP address. The more services you build and integrate into the data services engine, the more rich your operational tooling becomes automatically. So, so the next logical step is to take something like Jira and Confluence and be able to tie those in so you could update documents. That's exactly right. 
and also being able to uh, pipeline these things together so that um, you can you know do interesting uh, things similar to Unix, right? Derek, do you when you do this command, do you use the data accumulated in the your engine, or do you send queries out to Plexi yeah. controller and so when you check. do the decorate Mac, um, that's actually uh, that's actually getting fresh data. It's not using cache data. Okay, so you you go out and you send queries to every data source, asking, do you know anything about this thingy? That's exactly right. Okay. Yeah, because this MAC address might otherwise not be interesting to anything else, right? Sure. But, but you as an operator may not know that. So when you put that MAC address in, it just goes and gets fresh data about the MAC address. It doesn't use cache data. Um, we only have two minutes left, so if we could bring the prizes out, could you do that for me? Um, I'm going to go ahead and ask some questions here. So I know that you use this for Plexi, but I could use this on Cisco switches or Arista switches or any other switch. You you, sure. Yeah, you could use Netcom, you can make a net, Netcom channel. So that really plays into the fact that you are driving a movement and you're leading it. And right how I say, I see you guys with a really strong, what I would say is enterprise service bus, but what you call it, and you're pushing the way through with standardization and automation. Yeah, it's, it's, yeah we don't it's, a, really it's, a, it's a rousing. It's we don't really want to think cool. customers to think of this as a one-off. Because no, the data, that's that, when they're building it into these channels, we want right. to use them for all the um, we have data, like that. That, all the sources that can use Whoa. it. Whoa. Oh, look at this. Yes. <laughs> Go for oh questions. my. Uh -huh. Wow. Nice. Hmm? Oh, yeah. So um, this is another thing. Uh, we're going to open source this. Wow. 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 wow.